So our first example, we have the question, is the conjecture all products of a number with itself are greater than the original value true or false? If it is false, give a counterexample. So when we're thinking in terms of inductive reasoning, we're thinking in terms of induction, it's an abbreviation, it kind of refers to a different thing. I'll use those terms interchangeably just for the sake of saving on syllables. What we're going to be talking about here is giving specific cases that lead towards a conclusion. That, thinking etymologically, the word induction and inductive come from Latin by way of Greek, or is it Greek by way of Latin? I think I, I, think I said that backwards. But point is, this comes from Aristotelian ideas? Jesus, it's not my day for words. Um, but it comes from Aristotle through Cicero, where the phrase that we're building off of is one that translates to leading to. We are taking our pieces and see what they lead to, where in this case some pieces we could consider are numbers that are, well, anything we might want. So we're about numbers that are products of a thing with itself, that is, squares. And if we look at something like 2 multiplied by 2, we get 4. Or if we take something like 4 multiplied by 4, we get 16, or 15 multiplied by 15, we get 225. And the point is, we can take any number of these examples, and we will get something that looks like our result is true. Where, for reference, this sort of notation here, this double-lined arrow, says implies. So these things we think might imply that that's true. I'm going to leave a question mark there, because... Well, we have some examples, but we only need one in order for it to not work the way that we're hoping it does. And by the way, no matter how much math you guys learn in this class, you're all going to learn one thing in particular, and that is I, I don't have very good handwriting. I try to work on it, and believe me, it actually has improved. I'm not going to show you examples of what my handwriting used to look like to uh, make that case, but... We're going to try and use typing in pictures as much as possible here as well to avoid the fact that, well, cleanliness is a bigger issue than it needs to be. Anyway, getting back to our idea here in particular, we have these cases that tell us what we want, but maybe there are others that don't work. You know, I picked some numbers here that aren't very big, but let's think about what would happen if we went smaller. What if I took 1? I looked at 1 squared. 1 times 1, hopefully even though this is a math class for people who aren't the most inclined, with math that is, you can tell that 1 times 1 is equal to 1, which is certainly not also bigger than 1, otherwise math would have some problems. And for that matter, if we took other smaller numbers, something like 0 times 0, we'd still get 0. Or, if we took 1 half times 1 half, we'd get something even more instructive. we get 1 fourth. And while, yes, the understanding of fractions is sometimes a bit clunky. Hopefully we do know that one-fourth, one-quarter, 25% is actually smaller than one-half, or 50%. So from these, we actually get that it is not true. And here are our perfectly valid counterexamples. Technically speaking, for this conjecture, any number between zero and and 1 would be a valid counterexample. And when we're talking about these sorts of things, these sorts of conjectures, sometimes what we can do is ignore the problems, in a sense. We can discount the stuff that doesn't work the way we want it to and talk about the things that do. So we could say that this is true for maybe numbers bigger than 1. But for what we have as it is, it's not good enough. So let's get one more example here in terms of the sort of thinking that we can have when we're talking about inductive reasoning. So for our second example, we want to consider the list of numbers 4, 12, 36, 108, and so on to try and figure out what the next value will be. So what we can do here is think about what sort of pattern we're forming. Because again, inductive reasoning is all about noticing a pattern. So let's take some specific cases. Let's go from our first to our second, and then think about what happened when we went from our second to our third. So going from 4 to 12 is either 
adding 8 or multiplying by 3. Okay, so thinking about what we did in our first step, those are the two things that could have happened. And then we're going to see what happens with the second step and compare, figure out which one might be in common there. If there is a pattern, it's not guaranteed to be a pattern, I and mean, hopefully you can tell if there is, but anyway, here, thinking in that same way, we can either add 24, which is definitely not the same as adding 8. So these can't be true because we have one counterexample each. Doesn't matter what would happen in the other cases. If one's wrong, it's all wrong. But the other option is multiplying by three. So we have in the first two cases, you multiply by three, and hopefully you can tell or figure out, depending on how confident you are in your arithmetic, that 36 times three is 108. So if you want to keep going from here, you want to get your next number, then probably what we would want to do here is take the value that we have for the fourth number, 108, and multiply that by 3, where 108 times 3 is going to end up being 324. Where I will say for this that we've only got four examples to build off of. For our purposes in this class, that's usually going to be enough. If we had less than that, we'd start to question things maybe. And if we had more than that, we'd maybe be a bit more confident. But in general, if we were to be more technical here, more exacting, more, I guess you could say, correct, we'd need a little bit more information. We need to do something a bit more process-driven, a thing called induction. Not just using inductive reasoning, but actually rigorously proving this through careful case considerations and a little bit of logic that's a bit outside the scope of this class, but it's worth mentioning that to technically be sure, there's more to be done here than just noticing you're multiplying by three. We want to be a bit more careful about how this comes together. And in terms of being a bit more careful, even though we're not going to see that, we are going to see a little bit in terms of how we can do something else with our inductive reasoning to make different sorts of conclusions using what is called deductive reasoning instead.